So, so hi, hi everyone. My name is uh, Nicolas Pitre. Um, I've been working on Linux for like the last 25 years or something like that. I'm not getting younger. Um, I presented for the first time at LPC like 12 years ago, and I have to blame Kate for that. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really out of my comfort zone doing this. Uh, you doing it. For those who uh, don't know me, I'm blind. So if you want to ask a question, please interrupt me because otherwise uh, you might wait for quite a while. Yeah. Um, it'll pass you the, the, the catch box too. Right. Uh, for, for quite a while, I, I was a big proponent of shrinking the Linux kernel to address the embedded world. So I, I, I wrote um, a series, a couple article on LWN about that. Eventually, I gave in. I decided to move to Zephyr, and my first uh, my first assignment on Zephyr was to port it to 64 bits. So <laughs> that's a good way to get acquainted with a new system. So today, I'm going to talk about my um, work on the FPU context switching on Zephyr for the ARM64 and RISC-V. Yeah. So for let, let's recap what the, what's a floating point is. I suppose that most people here are aware of that. But a floating point is basically three components. You have the uh, the base. The sig the significant with a D and an exponent. So basically, you do the, the significant times the base with the power of the exponent. Slide number four, please. So where's the point? By convention, the point is located right next to the first digit of the significant. Slide number five. So here we have an example of how it works, the resulting value. You have those two components, the three components, and you fetch the final value out of that. If we go to with computers, we want a binary representation. So the base, it's easy, it's two. So the, the, the multiplier becomes a bit shift. Uh, slide number seven. Since it's binary, the first uh, significant number is always a one. All the values you can see there, you have the one everywhere. So we can drop it. So it's one with one more bit free for the rest of the value you want to, to encode. To, to encode. So there's. Uh, Initially, like in the 60s and the 70s, everyone was doing their own floating point uh, representation. And in, in the 80s, some people then decided it was time to do for that, for the IEEE, where 754 was created for that. So they, they have a different uh, variation of that, the single precision double precision, so the different bits, 32 bits for one, 64 bits for the other one. So, slide nine, right? So here you have the bit assignment for that. You know, one bit for the sign, one bit for the, uh, the exponent, and one bit for the mantissa. Um, there's also a um, variation on I, IEEE 754 for fuse multiply add. It's not the same floating point calculation. So if you do a lot of work in the embedded space with heavy, heavy, heavy floating point arithmetic, you will get different values uh, if you use fuse multiply add versus traditional floating point. So be aware of that. Sure. 
Okay, so if we want to multiply two numbers, it's a bit complicated because then we have to, if we want to do in software, we have to extract the different components. Sorry. I knew we would do that. I'm, I'm trying to do this teenager, teenager style. It brought me to slide 42, which is not right. 10, you said, eh? Round 10. Okay, that's it. So we need to determine the sign, that's okay, easy. We need to put back the uh, significant bit that we removed when we extracted the Amantisa. Multiply all the significant together. Adjust the exponent if it's necessary. Put all the results back together. So that's for multiplication. Slide 11. If we want to do an add, it's even more complicated. It's counterintuitive because when we're at school, additions are, are easier. But in this case, we need to, to align things with the, the same exponent. We then have to add values together, find out if we need to readjust the exponent, take care of, of the uh, the overflows, the uh, the rescaling, everything. So it's even it's even more complicated in that case. So slide twelve. Thing is, doing uh, floating point software is it's slow. It requires several uh, CPU instructions. Uh, for example, if you want to have a proper result. To, to multiply two results, uh, two single precision results, you need to have a 48, 48 uh, result multiplier. It's even worse for uh, double precision. You need 104 bit precision for your multiplication. And divisions are requiring multiple loops. So a long time ago, <laughs> It was one of my uh, my pet peeves it was to to create the arm fully arm assembly version of the soft float library for GCC. So I know I know how it hard it can be hard. Still, even in pure assembly, it requires a lot of cycles. There there's an, uh, there's a table here. It lists all the, the amount of instructions needed to, uh, to apply all those um, operations that the GCC requires to implement floating point operations. So what, what should we do? We create hardware, FBUs. So FPU is dedicated, dedicated hardware to perform all those operations in hardware. So we have much faster execution than software. You can do, usually you have add, uh, multiply, divide, uh, square root, and all those things. And some of them can even do tra transient uh, operations. Fifteen, right? Yeah. So the FPUs, they have their own register file. So if you look at the ARM64 one, its, it's context is up to 5 and 12 bytes. Same thing for the RISC file. OK. Now, the, relations, re, the relationship with this, the Zephyr project. Zephyr is a small real-time operating system. It's highly configurable, and it's optimized for small memory systems. So in Zephyr 17, we have different options for floating point support. 
either there is no support at all so everything is done in software like we we saw before especially on on those microcontrollers without any fpus then you have to have that library on the side that will do everything in software you could have the a global fpu usage that means the fpu is there it can be used but the zephyr uh, infrastructure is not aware of it of its presence in that case if you're sure that you have only one thread doing floating point, then you can go without any infrastructure from the OS because you know what you're doing, right? Uh, the other option is to have FPU sharing. That means the, the OS get involved by sharing the FPU resources between the threads and are arbitrating the access to that. That means in that case that you have to do context switching between the different FPU contexts. So what's the advantage? You don't have to be aware in your application, in your thread, that you're sharing the FPU with, with someone else. You don't have to do special reservation for the FPU and so forth. So the, the threads don't have to be aware of other threads using the FPU either. So, and in that case, you're, you're less of a risk in running into FPU uh, stepping on each other. The cons of that is that you're getting more uh, overhead in your context switching. Because as we've seen, the, the, the uh, context for the FPU might be quite large. So the simple approach of course, it's like when you want to do a task switch, you push all the, the, the regular register on the stack, push your, your FPU register on the stack as well, stash the stack pointer, retrieve the incoming task stack pointer as well, pop the, uh, the FPU register, puff the, the, the regular registers, and then you're gone. But in, in that case, step two and five are the most expensive when you yeah, in your test switch. Okay. Thing is, in the system, you rarely have multiple threads doing FPU at the same time. So why to why pay this overhead if most of the threads are not doing any floating point operations? In most cases, do you have no threads doing any FPU operations at all? Or maybe there's only one thread doing a few operations. So we need a smarter approach. It's called lazy FPU context switching. Thing is, we do like we did before. We push out uh, the, the uh, regular registers to the stack and then disable FPU register access. When you start a new task, the FPU access is denied if you, if you try to access it. In that case, we, we just skip over all the uh, most costly uh, operation of a task that we saw before. If thread B starts using the FPU, because the FPU access is disabled, then we get a trap. In, in the accession trap, then we check if the FPU was used by another, another thread before, and then we push that context to that original thread, retrieve the FPU content for the current thread, enable the FPU access, and resume thread execution. The thing is, in that case, we cannot save the context on the stack anymore because if we, we were asynchronously pushing the uh, FPU context off some thread that we don't know it was the previous one or the next before the previous, and its stack might be in a different state. So we need to have a special area in that case to save the uh, FPU context. Twenty-three, right? Yes. Okay. So for this to work, 
we need a, a global variable that indicates which thread is the owner of the CPU context. It, it, it doesn't have to be this, the thread that is currently running. It just means that the content of the CPU belongs to one of the thread that used to be running on the, on the system. And then in each thread uh, structure, we need a, a dedicated area to save that context because we, don't, we cannot use the stack anymore. Okay, but that's a bit naive. We can optimize it further. If the incoming thread in, in context switch is the owner of the FPU, we can just turn on access right away. We don't have to wait for the access to come and trigger uh, an access fault. So on slide 25, you have a sequence there. I won't read it out loud to you, but you can see probably the, the different states, uh, how the FPU is being enabled, disabled, and when we can skip the, uh, the, the FPU access as a strap when, when possible. Now, what about exceptions? Zephyr has different exception contexts. We can have uh, system calls, interrupt requests, or a CPU faults if you have a, a memory access fault, things like that. Of course, if we cannot store the FPU context on the stack anymore, we cannot use the FPU in, in exception context. So oh, that's it. Normally there's an exception being raised. We save the registers on the stack. We execute the exception code. We restore our regular uh, register content and resume the normal uh, execution, execution mode. It again. Where are we? So, if we cannot accept that FPU account, uh, FPU can be used uh, if we if we let it being used in exception context, we might corrupt the uh, the uh, threads content. So, let's prevent it. So we do what, like we did with the regular context switching. We just disable access to the FPU when entering an exception. And if the thread being run is the owner of the FPU, upon exiting the uh, exception context, we just re-enable access to the FPU. But the thing is, Maybe we can let it access, we can let exception context access FDU after all. If the FPU uh, uh, is being accessed into exception context, we raise another exception on top. We can flush the content of the FPU to the owning thread. And then we set the owner to none. So the, the, the exception context can use the FPU while it's being, it's been processed by the, the CPU. And then we, when we resume normal execution, since the owner is not a thread anymore, we just disable access to the FPU like we, we saw before. So we see, finally, we, we can let FPU access in exception context. But the thing is, because the exception context has nowhere to save its own context, we cannot have stacked exception with FPU usage. We cannot save the context on the stack 
And anyway, the exception context is short-lived. That's not something that you expect to be uh, to stay in for, for a long period of time. So since the exception context is, is short-lived, we can just drop the FPU context as well when the exception is done. The, on, the only thing that we have to do is, is to prevent another interrupt uh, coming in while we are in exception and being, being using the FPU because otherwise if you have stacked uh, exception contacts using the FPU, then, then now, now you, you, can, you, you cannot use this scheme anymore. So what we do again, When the CPU, when the FPU trap exception is being used, we do what we, we did before, we, we push the context, but then we disable our queue to the interrupted context. So when you go back to your system call, the, the reminder of your system call will run with interrupt disabled to prevent any recursive usage of the FPU at that point. So, just to conclude on, on that, exceptions in uh, FPU usage in exception context is okay if we're careful. So, we need to remember that our queues are disabled for the reminder of the exception until the exception is, is completed. So, and of course, if you have exceptions that are not being masked, like a memory fault or something like that, you, make, you, you must be sure that those are not using FP, the FPU. I, I think it's something that would be pretty special if you need FPU to do your uh, virtual memory mapping or something like that. Page, paging memory don't, doesn't require FPU most of the time. Thirty-three. Okay. Surprises. <laughs> On ARM sixty-four, if we have um, uh, veridic arguments, let's consider a simple usage of the uh, VA start here. On next slide, we see the resulting assembly code of that. If you can notice, there's a bunch of STR with the Q register. The Q is a Q that that's the floating point register on ARM64. According to the ARM uh, procedure call standard, if you have the first eight floating point arguments have to be passed into registers. Since here we have a very thick uh, argument list, we, we don't know if the caller is going to pass floating point arguments or not. So we don't have the choice to, to preserve the content of the, those registers anyway, just in case. So according to our previous scheme, as soon as you're going to use printf, printk, even the logging mechanism, you're going to trigger an, an F, uh, FPU uh, trap exception. Even if no floating point arguments are being used at all. So the, the consequences of that is as, as soon as you, 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 you use the print K, interrupts will be disabled. Uh, you will not be able to schedule this most of the CI tests doing the uh, scheduling are being broken because, of course, in those tests, we do some logging. Imagine when you want to debug those things and you try to do a print key and the print key is triggering the code that you want to debug. Mm -hmm. 36. 36 yeah. So, the way I found to get around the, this limitation is to do a little instruction emulation. So most of those uh, printk, printf, they don't use a floating point at all. 
uh, there's no point enabling the FPU for them. So the idea is, is to just in the trap handler to see if that this is a store queue register like we saw before and just emulate them. And because we got a trap, it means that the FPU was disabled. So probably that what it would store is a zero anyway. So the, this allows for our queues to remain on, the FPU to remain off. We don't have to, stress, to swap any uh, previous FPU context out, etc. Risk five, another surprise. There are no FPU trap exception at all. Only the illegal instruction trap. So, <laughs> yeah, what do we do? We need to decode the, 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 the instruction to be sure that the trap we receive, was it because of a floating point instruction or not? So next slide, we see all the instructions that we have to look for. There are different groups on the uh, RISC V uh, implementation. They are all listed there if you're interested. Thirty-nine. So here's the code to do the. Uh, the lookup for the instructions with it done in assembly is not that bad. Uh, anyway, we're, we're, if it's not for the uh, floating point instruction, it's an illegal instructions, so it's not path critical. There's one thing that goes for risk five though. Uh, it has the ability to provide a status bit that tells you if the floating point context is clean or dirty. So we can do a little optimization with that. So if, if it's clean, we can skip the pushing of the uh, FPU context when we do a context switch. And we can use that as well as an in, in indicator if the thread that's being using the FPU is still using it. So next slide, if you see it here, different state, we can see that if the FPU is clean, then we just skip the saving of the FPU context. And the next time we do a scheduling, we, we, we may decide that if it wasn't clean the, the previous time, then we can proactively reload it right away on context switching time because if it wasn't clean being context switched out, it's most likely that it wasn't middle of computation, so we will use it right away again. The next time the task is being scheduled out, if the FPU context was clean at a point, it means that the code is not actively using it any longer, so the next time we may return to our lazy context switching scheme that it means that if you have two threads uh, competing for the FPU, at that point we can save on the overhead uh, for, from the trap of the FPU access because we can preemptively load and restore the FPU context at context switch time right away. SMP, what happens if you get a trap, you want to retrieve your uh, FPU context, but it's live on another CPU. So in that case, we need an IPI to tell the other CPU, hey, just save my context into memory so I can get back to it, please. Uh, okay. 44, part of the surprises. <laughs> of course, it had, it had to happen. At some point, you can have a thread that wants 
another CPU to release its FPU context, but that other CPU is waiting for you to release a spin lock. So how do we fix that? Either we forbid FPU usage under a spin lock. That might be difficult. We just have to think about the ARM64 uh, variable number of arguments. That would mean forbid any uh, printf within the lock, which is a bit difficult, especially for the logging subsystem. Uh, we could re-enable RQs while a lock is being contended. Then the IPI will go through. But the thing is, if you have uh, like a ticket spin lock enabled, then you could race with your own RQs if you want to have a lock being taken in your uh, your uh, RQ handler. So the thing is, wh what we came up with is to have a small function that can be overridden by architecture is to have a special, uh, I I'm busy waiting for a lock hook. And that's where we can look at the if there's an IPI pending and just process it. So that's what was implemented. So oh, here are the, the pointers to all the source code I've been talking about. If you want to have a look, it's probably easier for you to have to study that other than on the slides. So that's it for me. Any questions? With the actually, um, yeah, I have a question, actually. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay, you have to throw it out there. I think it's the same mic here. Take it back. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, of course, we talked about ticket spin locks, and that just went in just the other day into uh, Zephyr. Uh, and I'm wondering, now that you mentioned it, are there any other kind of surprises waiting for us, do you think? Or is it pretty well a solved problem now? Well, one surprise I had is that just by writing those slides, I did some going back into the code at, and into the documentation. And, it, and then I realized that some of the instructions that uh, needed to be looked at from the RISC-V uh, illegal instruction handler, I was missing a big block of those instructions. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that code has been in the tree for more than a year now. And nobody complained because when you hit one of those instructions, if it's not trapped as illegal floating point instructions, would would just have your task being killed. Surprise. So <laughs> it wasn't there. So probably that is nobody had encountered that timing corner case. Corner case because if if the, the floating point is being enabled by a previous instructions, then it was just go through without any trap. Cool. So the, the fix for that landed in the tree this Monday. Wow. <laughs> okay, we got another question. Um, so I don't think you're going to notice it on ARM64, but is does the RISC-V cover 32-bit and 64? Yeah. Okay. So maybe on the 32-bit the with floating point, maybe you can notice a power difference between floating point unit being on and disabled? on some CPUs, have you, is there, the lazy um, approach keeps the floating point disabled for um, large parts of the code. So I was wondering if you, if anybody's noticed any power savings from that. Well, actually it will keep it disabled for every time, as long as you're not using any of floating point instructions. So right. by the time that you use one of those instructions, then it will be turned on. But otherwise, it's off all the time. And I didn't have the chance to play with actual hardware and do some power management uh, measurements. So I don't know for sure if, if people implemented some gate. Well, I don't, uh, I'm not sure. It depends. If you do some power gating, then you might lose your context to the floating point unit. And it's probably not a good thing then. If you do so, you will have to flush its content. 
but if it's disabled, then you should have all the registers in your thread storage, yeah. right? But the thing is, it's disabled in the sense that uh, access to those registers uh, is being okay. forbidden. So it doesn't you're mean relying on the context being there for the fast restore. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, if you you reschedule one thread that used to be the only one using the FPU, then it will be re-enabled right away. So it'd be a little different technique if you actually wanted to, to power save the... Yeah, if the you FPU. want to... Work, it can be done, of course. If you want to power save, it can be hooked into this as if one thread is flagged as not being an active user of the FPU anymore, then you can just flush its content and mm -hmm. power gate the FPU. It can be done. Would this apply to Cortex-M, 32-bit ARM? I, I'm not aware of uh, the uh, specifics of Cortex-M. Anyone else in the crowd for questions? Or... Oh, yeah, please, please ask questions. <laughs> I, I, I... Keith is going to ask you a question. <laughs> it's going to be hard. I'm much more comfortable answering questions without following a script, obviously. <laughs> So you talked about having a, a, a per thread context in the thread structure to save the floating point registers. Yeah. Um, would it be possible to just have a pointer in that? And so that when a thread knew that it needed to save floating point registers, it could increment the stack pointer and put a point that uh, pointer to that save area in the thread context. That way we could save the memory on for threads that weren't using floating point. Well, I guess it could be done, but in the end, it's one other and it's one additional uh, stack usage that your user might not be aware of. So, but only for only for threads that were using floating point uh, registers. So they they could be they could know that the threads that weren't the my my thought was could you have threads that weren't using floating point not have to have that memory usage in their thread block. I think it's it's a good idea. Okay, it's a good idea. It could, it could be done. Probably yes. It's Time a good to go point. Type some code. Maybe opt out, or what do you think? Opt in or opt out? I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, if your thread isn't effectively used, floating point, you could just get the exceptions. Instead. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. The, yeah. the thing is, uh, right now in Zephyr, it's it's not clear. Depending on the architecture, you need to to specify if you want to be using FPU or not. If if you don't, the FPU will just trap on you and kill you. <laughs> but uh, in this case, I I just implemented it. So if you use it, then it will be available to you. If you don't use it, then it will remain available to, to yeah, other I guess threads. that's a, a question. Do, do we want to have a, an opt-in mechanism where threads could signal, yes, I want to use the FPU. And if that bit wasn't set, you could actually trap and generate an exception and say, why yeah. is this thread using the FPU? But in, in that case, if your thread is going to use FPU, probably that your developer will know that it has to, to make some provision on the stack for that, and if you're not aware of that stack revisions, just because you're not using a few, and then it will it won't affect you. And and the thing is, uh, if I think of it, uh, that stack space has to be on the privileged stack as well, because we don't trust the user thread stack when we get an exception. Yeah, you so could poison, you could poison it. Yeah, uh, I think we're just actually a little bit over time, but uh, any last questions or is that everybody good? Awesome. Okay, okay. another round. Please.